supporting evidence for that kind of thing from, uh, from psycholinguistics. Uh, there, there is a level of, of categorization that we seem to manifest more or less automatically or implicitly. So, for example, when children perceive animals, they, they, they perceive at the level of cat or dog. They don't, they don't perceive at the level of subspecies like Siamese cat or, or, uh, or, or uh, let's say Samoid. You know, there's, there's this, there's a natural. I can't remember what they call that base category, something like that. It's usually specified by very short words that are easily learnable, and so the linguistic system seems to map right onto the, to the object recognition, pa uh, characteristics of the sensory systems that are built right into it. And and if they weren't built into it, we couldn't communicate easily because our natural categories. I think that's it, but it's probably wrong. Our natural categories, they have to be the same for everyone or it would be very difficult for us to communicate. Okay, so having said all that, then the question is, well, what are the most what are the most real categories? And I think there's there's a real division in ways to think about this because there's a scientific way of thinking about it. And and in in that case the most real categories are well, mathematical equations certainly seem to be in, in the top category there, the equations that describe the physical universe, but then, then the, the hypothesis of, of the existence of such things as protons and, and electrons and you know, the, 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 the material elements that make up everything that's every element of being, with the possible exception of empty space. Um, but in the, in the mythological world, the categories I think are more derived from Darwinian by the effect of Darwinian processes on cognitive and perceptual function. So, which is to say that we have learned to perceive and then to infer those things that are most necessary for us in order to continue our existence, propagate, live well, all of those things. And that would be true at the level of individual survival, and maybe it's also true at the level of group survival, although, you know, the, there's a tremendous debate among evolutionary biologists about whether or not selection can take place at the level of the group. Anyways, there are these basic level categories that manifest themselves to you and then there's categories of the imagination that you have to infer up from the sensory domain and we do that partly in science by comparing our sensory representations across people but we also do it by thinking abstractly, conceptualizing abstractly and you know, one of the things that's interesting about abstractions is it's not clear whether they're more or less real than the things they're abstracted from you know, th this is a perennial debate among, let's call them ontologists, who are interested in the fundamental, fundamental nature of reality itself, in some sense independent of conceptual structures, are numbers more or less real than the things they represent? It's a really hard question to answer, because knowing, like using numbers as a representational system gives you unbelievable power. And there are mathematicians that believe that there isn't anything more real than mathematical representations. Now, it depends to some degree, of course, on how you classify reality. That's the problem with a question like, is A uh, equivalent to B? The answer to that always is, well, it depends on how you define A and it depends on how you define B. So, generally, it's not a very useful question. But you can still get the point that there's something very real about abstractions. Incredibly real, because otherwise, why would you bother with them? They wouldn't give you any handle on the world. So what's the, what's the most useful, or what's the most, what's the broadest possible level of abstraction? And is there any use of, any utility in thinking in that manner? And I tried to make the case last time that, that in the mythological world there are three categories, or four, depending on what you do with the strange fourth category. Because the fourth category is sort of the category of uncategorizable entities. And so it's sort of the category of everything that not only do you not know, but you don't know you don't know it. It's, it's, or you could think about it as the category of potential. I actually think that's the best way to think about it, is that it's the dragon of chaos is the category of potential. And I do believe that where our materialist view is essentially wrong. I think that the proper way of looking at, the, at being is that being is potential, and from that potential, whatever consciousness is, extracts out the reality that we inhabit. Anyways, that's certainly the mythological viewpoint, and 
And, but it's not just a mythological viewpoint. It, it, it's the, it's, a, it's a, a sequence of ideas, for example, that deeply underlies the thinking of Jean Piaget. And Piaget, by the way, was very interested in reconciling the gap between religion and science. That's really what he devoted his life to doing. And so, and there are other streams of philosophy, and I would say Heidegger, the phenomenologists, are, are thinking along lines that are similar to this as well. Because Heidegger was concerned not with the nature of material reality, but with being as such. And, and, and so, you can extract out the viewpoint that I just described from, from mythology, but it isn't the only source of such, um, what would you call it? Uh, hy hypotheses is probably the right idea. So, so the idea, you can think about this as a bootstrapping process in some sense. Is in order for anything to get going, it has to bootstrap itself up and become more and more complex as it does that. So it's, it's like, this is the answer to the chicken and egg problem, right? Which was first, the chicken or the egg? Well, neither. Something from which both the chicken and egg were derived, right? Because the, the, ultimate, the ultimate answer to that is the answer to how there are things at all. Who knows? But at some point there were neither chickens nor eggs, but there were the things that were the precursors to those things. And so they spiraled upwards in some sense, and those, those in, 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 initial uh, proto-entities, single-celled animals for, I mean you can go back farther than that, but we could say, well single-celled animals differentiated over time, right, and there's this looping process that, that differentiates out into both the chicken and the egg. So, but what the question is, what do you need in order for that process to begin? And that's really the question of what the fundamental constituent elements of reality are. And the mythological hypothesis is that there's or three or four. One is the fact that there has to be something that, 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 that manifests itself as an observer. It's something like that. Some kind of observer. Now, where that process of observation starts in the phylogenetic chain is very, very difficult to tell. You know, we might say, well, there's certainly no possibility of a conscious observer until there's a differentiated nerve.